Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's so good to see all of you here this morning on this great fall morning. What terrific fall weather we've been having. This is why we moved to Iowa. We have a huge celebration today with a family in the church, and I didn't ask them first, but it's in the newspaper, so I'm just going to embarrass them. Art and Bev Ham, would you stand up holding hands there? They are celebrating 60 years of glorious marriage. If I had a glass, I'd ding it like that so that you'd have to give her a kiss. Huh? Oh, oh yeah! <laughs> it's a holy kiss. We have some other announcements today. A couple things going on in the life of the church. We're having a Bible study uh, every Wednesday morning at 9.30. It's called... Um, uh, what did I call it? Something about spilling over the Bible... Uh, Wednesday morning coffee was Sunday sermon, and it's where we talk about the scriptures that I'm going to preach on the next Sunday. And we get really deep into the, a lot of the things that don't make it into the sermon. And since we're going through the Old Testament this fall, we're, we're covering almost uh, every story as we move along. So it's a great survey of the Old Testament. And so you can join us for that on Wednesdays at 9.30. We also have some family Bible studies and some contemporary issue Bible studies, which are starting this Wednesday. Now, these will only be for a couple weeks, and then they'll end. But one of the ones that we're doing is the, the talk about transgender in our schools and in the media. And we're going to talk about uh, basically just an open-ended conversation of what what do we do, and, and is this real, and, and how is it affecting us? We're going to have one of the teachers from the school uh, share about some, some of the programs that we have. Jim DePriest uh, is going to share about a trip that some of the kids went on from the high school. And we're going to talk about um, how we can respond, how our kids can respond. So join us for that conversation Wednesday at 6.30. Um, today we have a, a special forum about water or thirsty world. And so we are going to hear about that mission and how we can support it and, and how we can be a part of that. So join us today for that in the fellowship hall. And then uh, it looks like we have folks lining up for announcements. So why don't you come on down? When the youth were at the Heifer Global Village this summer, the staff of Heifer reminded us that in the same passage where Jesus said, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat, he also said, I needed clothes and you clothed me. And whenever you do this for the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you do it unto me. And the Heifer staff introduced us and challenged us to take up that responsibility through a ministry called Little Dresses for Africa, where youth, churches, individuals can um, take this aspect of discipleship and help to clothe little girls in Africa. And they do it through such a simple process where you start with pillowcases and then, thanks to the efforts of Janet Cermak, I have some examples. Oops, excuse me. You make little dresses like this that are simple and colorful and that don't have things like zippers and buttons that could break or need repair. Here's one that just has the addition of a pocket to it. And we have one other, all from pillowcases. I'm, I'm not a sewer, but I think I might be able to cut out the armholes and cut some elastic and cut little squares for, uh, for pockets. The youth are going to be, uh, we learned about Little Dresses for Africa last week. This Wednesday night, youth group is going to be at the um, at the family nutrition and sewing classroom at the middle school where we have a dozen sewing machines uh, where we can uh, make dresses. Uh, I do need some 
adult help for this. Uh, Janet, are you able to be there Wednesday night? I think so, possibly. If I could have some other adults who know how to operate a sewing machine, uh, that would be helpful. Um, uh, Tia is going to feed us supper at the middle school at 6.30, and then from 7 to 8, we will be sewing. And so if you could join us in this, progress, this, um, this project, please see me after church. That would be wonderful. Also, you can help by, uh, on Monday or Tuesday, if you have some pillowcases, bright, colorful ones, in good shape, uh, that you no longer use, that you would want to donate to the project, you could donate your used ones, buy some new ones, and drop them off here at the church on Monday or Tuesday. Or uh, we do need to purchase some bias tape and some elastic. If I give this basket to Piper after church, uh, you could, um, if you want to make a contribution to the purchasing of a few supplies that we need to, that would be greatly appreciated. And I will also have some instructions for the little dresses for Africa if you want to uh, check to see if you have the appropriate things to donate, uh, or if you want to see if you have the skills required to help take one of these little instruction sheets from me. Thank you so much. Good morning. It's nice to see everyone. I am here this morning on behalf of the fundraising committee for our pro church project. Uh, we are zooming along. This indicates that we are at $36,000. There's better news than that. We are now at $65,000. 75. Oh, 75. Do we hear 85? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could have this done in just a matter of minutes. <laughs> so if you brought your pledge today and would like to put it in the offering, that would be lovely. If you've already turned it in, thank you very much. If you walked off without it, like the Olsons have a tendency to do, you're running out the door at the last minute and think, oh, it's sitting there. There are some extras out on uh, the table out here at this end of the hallway. You can't miss them. This, an envelope, everything, even the introductory letter that came with this. So uh, thank you so much for the contributions that you have made so far. Thank you so much for the contributions that are still to come in. Good morning. I just want to take a minute uh, to draw your attention to the insert in the bulletin, uh, Create a World of Peace. This is in reference to World Communion Sunday, which will be next Sunday, October 4th. Um, so what is World Communion Sunday? Well, it's, uh, it's really uh, uh, a way for the Presbyterian Church in the world to reach out to the world and try and do mission throughout the world in, in the name of peace. And if you read through this, this insert, it's a very good insert. It talks about risks to the peace around the world uh, and, and, and how this money can, can be used. Um, so, you know, when we talk about the obligatory pray for world peace, you know, when, when you add that, you tack that on at the end of your prayers, this is how God is reaching out is through things like this. This is how we try and accomplish that. So I would just ask you, ask you to give next week for that. Thank you. And I see we, we have some visitors with us today. If you would, sign the, the pads at the end of the pews and pass those down so that you can see who you're worshiping with and put your name and address and email and a phone number on there if you're visiting so that we can reach out to you and, and say hello and thanks for worshiping with us. We also have uh, a special presentation today. Whenever someone goes into the second grade, we present them with a Bible. And today we have Miss Zoe Long here uh, to receive her Bible. She's the granddaughter of Mary Murphy. And uh, Luann Martin is her mom and, and, her, and her stepdad is here. And, and we are so glad to, to have you here and to present you with this Bible. And, and Martha is going to talk.
Good morning, Zoe. This is a deep blue Bible. Why don't you look inside? Have you look in that? It's got it's different from Bibles you may have seen before. This is made specially for children, but big people can look on them too. It's got lots of notes about questions that you might have as you read through it, and it's in the Common English translation, which is a brand new translation based on the very oldest texts that have been found. Every second grader should know about Bible translations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the very the start of the book is about from the very beginning all the relationship that God has had with people. The back of the book is about Jesus. And I hope you have a good time reading that, okay? Thank you. Blessings, and, and so glad to see you. Here, you want to shake my hand? May God bless you. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder to please sign the, the uh, black book at the end of your pew to um, let the people in your row know who you are if you don't know who they are, and it gives us a chance to welcome any visitors. Would you please stand and join me in the call to worship? After the introit. <laughs> Okay, would you please join me in the call to worship? We come to worship to be close to the one whose heart is our home.
You may be seated. We have our habits of running from the truth, but at some point we must wrestle with our choices. Let us confess our sins before God and one another. O oh God, you meet us on the road of daily living. Our journeys have changed us. We are not the persons we once hoped to be. We turn back toward you with anxiety, wondering what the cost of our wandering might be. Although we have heard of your grace, we come as beggars with questioning hearts. Forgive us, Lord, and hear us as we confess to you in silence. It may be that we wrestle more deeply with our sins and are turning away than God does. We bargain only with ourselves, fighting for a blessing that is offered freely. Christ says to us, you have always been loved, and you are even now forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Surprise. <laughs> okay. When you look at me, the first thing you think of is, is there a baby? No, I'm sorry. not yet. <laughs> I wish I could say yes. Hopefully soon. For those of you who don't know, she's not pregnant. <laughs> her, her daughter, is, is Carrie, is expecting a baby any minute. In fact, they were hoping yesterday, but today. So, so yeah. They sent her home, told her to come back Tuesday. So we're hoping. <laughs> Some years ago, you may, those of you that were here may remember that we started giving two cents for every meal that we eat to a concern in um, usually South America or Africa. And that two cent a meal we found would feed somebody there. That's very little when we think of how much it costs to feed ourselves. As time went on, um, we have community services here in town that provide the food that's needed for people. And so we decided we would partner with them. And so the money that you give for today or at the end of every month is to help feed the hungry in Henry County. And each quarter the deacons send a check to community services and to the Fellowship Cup uh, for food and needs that they might have. So, like I said, while two cents is very cheap, give generously.
Let's let's offer a prayer over over these uh, pennies. And you know what? It's not just pennies. There's some stuff that crumbles in there too. It, we we like to kind of change the jingles, but the kind that crumbles is preferable. That's from the movie Coming to America. Remember that? Uh, so here, stay here. You want to help me pray? Yeah, so it's good to ask God's blessing so that these things grow and provide more and more. One of my favorite little stories is about the little engine that could, and they chug along and chug along, and then all of a sudden they make it. And this is just a little chug, little chug, and we're going to find that one day we're going to make it, and all God's children will be, will be fed. So let's, let's pray. Most holy God, we ask for your blessings upon these gifts, that they may grow, and that they may feed your people right here in Henry County. May they be multiplied, and may they do your will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Prepare our hearts, O Lord, to accept your word through song and words proclaimed. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may believe and obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning comes from the 32nd chapter of Genesis, verses 22 through 30. Listen now for these words from our Lord. The same night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, 
and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise, everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The words of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this fall, we are moving through the Old Testament from Genesis to the prophets, from the fall of Jerusalem to the return from exile. We started a couple of weeks ago with the Garden of Eden. Then last week we heard about Father Abraham and his wife Sarah and how they wanted to have a child. And then Sarah gave birth to Isaac. And today we meet again for the first time Isaac's son, Jacob. Jacob became Israel, that great nation for whom world policymakers still tiptoe. But before Jacob was renamed, he was a big heel. Literally, that is what his name meant. Heel, or supplanter, or usurper, or one who was devious. From the day of his birth, he was a trickster, grabbing and scrambling, figuring the angles to outsmart his brother and take over his birthright. Indeed, he even bargained for Esau's, his twin's brother's birthright for a cup of soup, for a cup of soup. And later, later, after Esau got so mad that he was going to kill his brother, Jacob went and lived with his even equally devious father-in-law, with whom he always jockeyed for an economic advantage. So you can bet that if the banking business had existed in his day, it was actually forbidden by uh, Hebraic law in that time. But that's another sermon when we get into stewardship campaigns. But if the banking system did exist back then, Jacob would have been the guy who was packaging derivatives and collecting those sweet executive bonuses. If Jacob was here today, he would have been an engineer at Volkswagen. Too soon. (laughs) Jacob was not a good guy. Even come out, coming out of the womb, he was pulling back his brother's leg so he could get ahead. And then at that one point, he went too far. Jacob stole his father's deathbed blessing from Esau. And Esau had enough. He was going to kill his brother like Cain. And so Jacob ran off. And he lived for 20 years in a very dysfunctional relationship with his in-laws. And eventually, he torched those connections too. See, everywhere Jacob went, he left relational carnage. That's what he did. So now Jacob is preparing to return home. He is getting ready to face his estranged brother, whom he had defrauded 20 years earlier. And it is under these circumstances and where we get a glimpse of just how Jacob is. Uh, that he sends his family out ahead of him to face these 400 people that Jacob had sent, that Esau had sent to meet them, armed soldiers of, of Esau's tribes, and he sends his wife and children up first, and he stays back. Jacob is not a good guy. 
And it's here, when he's alone, on the other side of the river, that he meets God. God doesn't come to him as some sweet, forgiving presence. Rather, under the cloak of darkness, God comes as a mysterious adversary, appearing from nowhere to accost Jacob in a wrestling match. Now, some say, some say that it could be said that this is not God at all that Jacob wrestles with because we don't actually know. It just says a man. The word in Hebrew is a a being. Some say it's an angel. Uh, There's this great little comic strip that says, and and the Lord God, the angel of the Lord said to Jacob, why why is thou hitting thyself? And it had the hands of the angel uh, making Jacob hit himself. We don't know who this person is. And one scholar that I read actually said, actually said that he thinks that it is Esau. And this guy said this because he has twins. And he said, who else in the world would see someone sleeping on the ground and think to pounce on them? A twin. And then they fight about this blessing over and over. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Right? And it's, it's perhaps Jacob wrestling with Esau, which actually has some credence because when Jacob and Esau meet again, Jacob says when he sees Esau, seeing you again is like seeing the face of God. So perhaps here Jacob is struggling with his past and some of his relationships. We don't know. But what we do know is very literally in the next sentence after the wrestling matches over, Jacob does say, I have seen the face of God. And so if we consider that this was God that Jacob was wrestling with, my question then becomes, what kind of God would let a wretch like Jacob win? I mean, God could have tossed him off at any given minute. He could have just walked away. But he didn't. God stays all night. And God even gives him a little tag in the hip that lasts forever to let him know uh, that this is a piece of humble pie. I could have done this any minute. But God stays there all night. I like this quote from Walter Brueggemann. It says, What kind of God is it who will be pressed to a draw by a man like this? And he answers his own question. It is the kind of God who wants a relationship with us. Have you ever seen a mom or dad wrestle with their child and let them win? We see it all the time where grown-ups let kids win. This is a parental quality that we see of God. Now, I did have an uncle, and this is important to know. I did have an uncle who would never let us win at anything. This was the kind of uncle who cheated at Go Fish (laughs) with a five-year-old. He was like Jacob. But really, this story is about God. Here we see that fatherly parental quality of God. It reminds me of my junior high years with my dad. See, my dad is is still and always will be just a little bit bigger than me. And and sometimes, uh, I guess, just like a a grandmother is always stronger uh, than her sons, right? A a mom is always stronger. Even if she's five foot nothing and the son's six foot two, she can still pin him with just a look. And, and that was kind of my relationship with my dad. But in junior high, I'd started playing football. And I'd started running every couple of days. And I was getting in pretty good shape. And uh, apparently, I had some natural hormonal imbalance of big-headedness. <laughs> it, 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 every teenage boy acquires this. Now, since I could remember, my dad and I would wrestle. And uh, when I was really little, my dad would let me win. And sometimes he would just roll me on top of his chest and say, oh, you got me, you got me, you got me, you got me. And, and when I pinned him down, he, he, would, he would say, you got me. And then the trick was uh, to punish him then with a wet willy. That is what you got when you got pinned. We learned that from my uncle. <laughs> so... I would, I would pin my dad on the ground and, and try to give him a wet willy. At, what, at which point, the wrestling match was over, the playful part, and off the kid went. Dad won. There was no wet willy. Uh, and as I got into my teenage years, 
the wrestling matches took on a little bit more meaning. My dad wouldn't give in so quickly. He was still playing, but I would get serious. And I would start wrestling a little bit harder, and I would exert a bit more force. And then he quit letting me just win. He would make me work for it. I had to earn a pin. Well, the fighting got really tough after I'd have him pinned. I would think that I'd done a good job because he made me earn it, and then I'd have him down, and I would go to deliver the punishment. At what point, at which point, I would be easily tossed aside, right? And it was over. But there was this one time. There was this one time where I got my dad pinned. I had him down, both arms on the ground. I put my knees on his arms. I was sitting on his chest, and I had my legs wrapped around his legs. He could not move. I had him down good, and I got the punishment ready. And I stuck it in his ear, and I got him so good, and he could not get away. The problem was, he loved it. He absolutely loved it. And I look back and I realize my dad at any point could have just ended any one of those wrestling matches. But the thing was, he wanted to do it. It was a rite of passage. It was a a blessing to do that together. And you know what? He was doing it with me. It was about the relationship, about a chance to do something with his son. And I think this is partly what's going on with God. God wanted to wrestle with Jacob. He wanted to have a relationship. And God continued to desire that relationship. And we see this by God renaming Jacob Israel, one who strives with God. God wants us to strive and to not give in. But more than that, God wants a relationship with us, which is, after all, why he sent his son, Jesus, and named him Emmanuel, God with us. And so here is a little bit of good news. If we find ourselves constantly wrestling with God, and never feeling blessed, if we find ourselves struggling with God and never finding a win, if we can never let our guard down and simply enjoy the relationship with our Creator, with the Spirit of life, then perhaps we are not wrestling with God. Perhaps we are wrestling with ourselves, with our past, with an old twin with relationships, with a future, with an illness. Perhaps we are often wrestling with ourselves. And here is a great haiku that I found early in the study for this text. If you don't know what a haiku is, it's a little poem, a Japanese poem that takes two points that are opposites and makes them the same almost, uh, a paradox or a contradiction. And it does it with 17 syllables, five in the first line, seven in the middle line, five on the last line. And here is the haiku that I have been praying with. It says, I have been wrestling. I think it is with my God, but it is with me. My prayer is that we may be set free through Christ and find victory from our struggles and God's relationship with us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Let us remain standing and say together, we believe, reciting the Apostles' Creed printed in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Perhaps if we quit wrestling for a minute, we might just see an angel sitting with us and enjoying every moment, even when we get a little too tense and too serious to enjoy the time together. God is with us. And so today we take a moment to pray, lifting up our world, our nation, our community, and our friends. And please join me in these prayers saying, hear our prayer after I pray each petition, ending with, Lord, in your mercy. Let us pray. O God of Jacob, on our journeys through life, we try to seek out your paths. We pray for the days we stumble, and we give thanks for the days we walk humbly with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the nature which surrounds us as we make our way in the world. The stones and the sand, the waters and the animals, the harvests and the beauty. We ask that we be good stewards of your creation, sharing all that you have given us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those seeking reconciliation like Jacob and Esau. For those open to it, and for those who are not yet open to it, may it happen in your time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for those in need, especially those we know fighting battles for health and relationships, for those expecting the birth of a child for those facing the end of life. We pray for those on long journeys, and especially those whose household is so small they can carry it with them wherever they go. Keep them safe and teach us ways to welcome them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For seasons of life, for the exuberant decisions of youth, for seasons of growth, For the season of returning to the ground from which you formed us, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We give thanks for the church, this community of your people, invited in and sent out again to show your love. May we, as your people gathered, give you thanks for giving us goals and calling us to live as witnesses. Strengthen us through this worship of you so that we may be sent as your servants. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray as Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Giving is not merely a financial transaction. Giving is a whole body act, engaging our mind, our will, our heart, and other muscles. Perhaps if we offer our deepest gift, 
We go on our way limping, but having been truly blessed, today's offering will now be received.
So the story of Jacob is a story of coming of age, of maturation in God. And it's, a, it's part of our story as well as we grow. And at one point, Jacob turned from his ways and he prayed this prayer to God. He said, O oh God, I am not worthy of the least of all the steadfast love and the faithfulness that you have shown to your servants. We are not worthy of God's love And yet God offers it to us each and every day. So may you know through your struggles that the God of grace is with you each and every day. Now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Alleluia. Amen. Would it be 